Hello, everyone. I hope everyone's been having a swell conference so far. I'm honored to present our next speaker, Brandon Chin. Brandon is a software engineer at Leap Year, and he'll be talking a bit about ASON schemas, an open source library he's been working on at Leap Year. It's supposed to extend the Haskell ASON library to make encoding and decoding complex data types easier. I'll be monitoring the chat for quick questions, but if you have any philosophical ones, make sure to join the Q&A chat afterwards. And without any further ado, here's Brandon. Thanks, Trevor. Um, thanks everyone for, for joining in. Um, let me go ahead and share my slides. All right. Um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for tuning in. Um, if you're, I, I want to give a special shout out to if you're on Pacific time like me, thanks for waking up. Um, we're going to get through all of this together. Um, yeah, so let's just go ahead and, and get started. So like Trevor said, um, today I'm going to talk about ASON schemas, um, a library that I, I started open sourcing at my company. Um, and, and yeah, so let's just go ahead and go into it. Um, this is going to be the agenda for today's talk. Uh, the first part of the talk, I'm going to go over a background and motivation as to why I wrote this library in the first place. Um, and, then, uh, and then I'll also be going over how to use this library as, just as a user. Um, and then the second part, we'll go over some key insights that, may, that uh, make this library work. Um, yeah, the, this, I try to structure this talk um, so that it would be easy to follow as long as you're comfortable with basic Haskell concepts. Um, so hopefully you can follow along. Um, and, and like Trevor said, if you have any questions about any of this, um, feel free to join the Q&A room afterwards and I'll be happy to go over um, more things with you. So first let's go over motivation. Why did I write this library in the first place? Well, if you've, if you've used Haskell before um, and you've dealt with JSON data before, you've probably used the ASON library. Um, the ASON library uh, provides, among many other things, these two type classes. Um, and these two type classes let you convert your custom data type to and from a JSON value. For this talk, we're primarily going to focus on from JSON and parsing JSON data into uh, a data type defined in Haskell. Typically, you wouldn't implement these type classes yourself. Typically, you would derive them using generic. Um, so in this case, we have our custom data type user with the ID and the name field. And when you derive from JSON through generic, what it will do is it will parse a user as a JSON object with an ID key and a name key like this. This is another example. And one thing I want to point out is for this single JSON blob, you need three of these data types. Um, you can't inline or combine these data types at all. Um, because result has a list of permissions and permission has a maybe resource. Um, and so unless you enjoy working with nested tuples, um, you can't combine these at all and you have to keep these as three separate data types. Another thing to point out is that um, result and resource both have a field called name. And when you have the same uh, name in a record, uh, it becomes difficult to use that field um, at the call site. Uh, the canonical solution to this in Haskell is you would prefix the fields like result name or re resource name. Um, but again, that would mean you'd have to, you, you wouldn't be able to um, automatically derive uh, from JSON. You would have to implement it manually um, because um, to, when you derive from JSON with generic, the record names need to match the, the JSON key names exactly. Um, but notice that even if you manually derive from JSON, you still need all three of these data types. So it's still not a perfect solution. Um, one of the main motivations that led me to writing this library was I wanted to query a GraphQL API from Haskell. Um, I know that Hasura did a lightning talk right before this, and unfortunately I wasn't able to join, um, but Hasura does a lot of GraphQL stuff. So hopefully they primed you for, for this section right here. Um, GraphQL, if you're not familiar, um, is an alternative to REST, where you send a structured query that specifies exactly what fields you want from the server. So on the left here, you can see um, ex an example schema that the server might have. Um, and on the right side, you would see a query that you would send to the server. You'll note that the post type 
has a created at field. But if you don't care about that field in a particular query, you can choose to omit it. And the GraphQL spec will say that the response of the API will give you back um, a, a JSON blob um, that has the same format as the query you specified here. So with that, uh, let's say that you want to query a GraphQL API in Haskell, and you want to get a response back from the API um, and load it in to Haskell. Um, how should we write our Haskell data types to represent this response? The first option is we could just directly translate the GraphQL schema into Haskell data types. Um, so the benefit of this is we get a one-to-one -one mapping of uh, GraphQL types to Haskell types, which is good. It will scale no matter how many queries you write, you will have the same number of types. Um, but one of the problems is that you would have to handle nothing every time you get a field out of the response, right? Even if you know that a particular query is going to return a field, you still have to handle nothing because the type is maybe here. Another option that we have is we could define a data type for every, every time that it's used in a query. And so the benefit of this is, of course, there's no more maybes, because if you send a query and you get back a response, you're guaranteed that the response is going to contain that field, right, if, if it comes back successfully. Now, the downside is we would have to redefine a type every time you use it in a query, which is not that bad. You could generate, uh, you could use template Haskell to generate all of these data types. Um, but it, it definitely won't scale. For example, um, you would have to import X types every time you make a query, where the number of types depends on the types you use in the query. Um, and then we still have the problem where record names are duplicated, like user and post here both still have the ID and the name fields. So now that we've seen some of the problems um, with the current situation, um, what, what are some of the requirements that we have in writing a solution? Um, one thing that I do want to point out is that none of this is ASON's fault, but rather it's due to the way that we're forced to write Haskell data types um, and, and define them and use them um, that makes things difficult to use. So the first requirement that we have is, of course, type safety. I mean, we're Haskell devs after all. If we don't have type safety, what are we? One of the primary ways that type safety would be nice is if we know a schema of the JSON object, it would be nice if the compiler could check that the keys that we're extracting out of the object are checked at compile time. The second thing that would be nice to have is it'd be nice to avoid polluting the namespace. As we saw earlier, when you define multiple record fields with the same name, um, it could cause conflicts when you actually use them um, at, at the call site. Um, it would also prevent, um, when you pollute the namespace, it could also shadow other variables. Um, and it's also conceivable that JSON data would have keys that are reserved keywords in Haskell, like if you had a JSON key called type. And lastly, it would be nice if we could get a, a better query language out of it. Um, Record fields are notoriously bad at getting data out of nested data types. Um, and in, in my opinion, lenses aren't that much better at this problem. So with these requirements in mind, um, I started using um, or started experimenting with uh, this library. So what I'm going to do first um, is uh, go over how would a user use this library. If you, if you imported this library that I wrote, um, how would you use it? So what you would do first is you would define the schema using the schema quasi quoter. And uh, here we're assigning that schema that you define um, to the type alias my schema. And then what you can do is use the standard decode functions you get from ASON to decode an object my schema. And then you can use the get quasi quoter to extract data from this object. So in this case, you would get the user's key from the object. And then for every user in that list, you would get their name. Going back to the problem requirements, um, do, does this library fit all the requirements that we had? So first of all, this is type safe. If you try to use the get quasi quoter and try to do object.users.foo, you'll, you'll get a compile time error saying that the foo key doesn't exist in this schema. Secondly, we're, um, we're not putting too much stuff in the, in the namespace. 
Um, the only thing we're adding to the namespace is the my schema type alias. Um, there's no there's no more data types and no more record fields that we're adding to the namespace. And then lastly, using the get quasi quarter, we can get a nicer syntax to extracting data out of JSON objects um, than we would using just normal Haskell functions. Um, so, so going into a little bit more detail as to um, the schema quasi quarter, on the left side here, you'll see kind of the primitive JSON data types that you can use. So some of these are built in like bool, int, double, or text. Um, but you can also use any type that's in scope that has a from JSON instance. So UTC time here would work if you have it in scope because UTC, UTC time uh, has a from JSON instance. On the right side, you'll see a more complex schema with nested objects um, and lists and maybe um, uh, JSON values. Um, you'll note that list and maybe are both right associative. So the bar key here um, represents a list of maybe bools. Um, you don't need parentheses here. And then next, uh, we'll, we'll go over the get quasi quarter. Um, if you're familiar with the JQ tool, it's kind of a similar syntax. Um, the first line here shows how you would get nested keys um, through an object. Um, and again, these keys are checked at compile time to make sure that they exist in the schema as you traverse through it. The second line here shows how you would use the get quasi quarter to generate a Lambda function. Um, and users here is just a normal Haskell list of, of ASON schema objects. And so you can use your normal list functions like map or fold to iterate through the list and then use the get quasi quarter to manipulate the objects that you come across. And the last line here shows how you can apply operations through lists and maybes. And as you can see, um, it's much better syntax than if you just use plain Haskell um, using map and fmap. So as a little demonstration, um, here I've defined the same schema in Haskell, and we're going to decode this JSON file. This JSON file will match the same schema that we've defined here. And if I go ahead and run it, um, what I can do first is uh, pretty print the schema. You, you can see that you can get a nice uh, pretty printed schema for you. Um, so if you're working with this in GHCI, it's pretty easy to, um, to inspect. And then we can go ahead and decode it. And it decoded successfully. And if we look at the type of result, we can see that result is an object my schema. Using the get quasi quarter, we can get the user's key from the object. And we can get for every, odd, for every user, their ID. And notice how this result is just a normal Haskell list of ints. So you can do, you can pass this to all of your other functions that take in a list of ints and manipulate it like that. Um, you can also get each user's name. And if you try to get a key that doesn't exist in the schema, you'll get a compile time error saying that the key doesn't exist in the schema. All right, so going back to the GraphQL use case really quickly, um, on the left side, you'll see a query that you would send. And on the right side, you can see the schema for the response of it. And remember how the GraphQL server is guaranteed to return a response that matches the query that you send. And so writing the schema in ASON schemas is pretty straightforward um, and it, it, it corresponds really nicely to the request. Um, remember, if you go back to the way that we defined this before, um, previously we, we had to use three data types to represent the response of this GraphQL query. Uh, but now we just have a single type alias and the ID and the name record fields are no longer in the namespace. So we can use ID and name as, as normal variables now. Um, and I'm actually working on another library that I'm gonna hopefully open source soon at my company um, that uh, implements, uh, it's called GraphQL client um, and it would generate these schemas for you given GraphQL input files. So be on the lookout for that. Um, and hopefully I can get that out soon and uh, if you're interested in querying a GraphQL API from Haskell, um, hopefully you can use that library. Yeah, Brandon, so, you have a quick question. Yeah. Um, so for the data, or for the list um, in your quasi quarter, where does that come from? The list in the quasi quarter. So I'm gonna, so result.users. So we're getting the user's key out of the result object. 
And as you can see in the schema, the user's key is a list of objects that match this schema, right? And so getting the user's key from the object, um, the, the brackets here is just the notation to say that the rest of the operations will apply on each object in the list. And so um, here it's going to go for every object inside of this list is going to get uh, the name key in it. And here in the JSON data, you can see that users is a list and uh, every item in the list is an object. Um, yeah, hopefully that helps a little bit. Um, so moving on, um, we're going to move into the second part of this presentation where we're going to go over how this library works and kind of uh, go through the type magic um, that we're able to use in order to um, have things checked at compile time and at runtime and things like that. Um, as you can imagine, there's probably, there's a lot of type magic going on in this library. Um, and so what I'm going to do first is give a very quick introduction to type level programming. Um, and then I'll go into implementing the actual library. So if you're, you're, you're probably familiar, if you've used Haskell before, um, of values and types. So for example, true and false are both values with the type of bool. And similarly, the maybe int type has a nothing value and it also has a just one value or just two or just three. And bool and maybe int are different types, but they actually have the same kind, which you can think of as the type of types. In this case, they're both the kind of star. Um, and the star kind is the, the kind of types that have values. So maybe by itself has the kind star to star because maybe needs to take in another type like int or bool in order for it to actually be a type. And maybe by itself doesn't have any values. You need, you need another type like maybe int in order to create a value of that type. You can't have a value with just the type maybe. So uh, one thing you can do is with the data kinds extension, true and false were previously values of the type bool, but now you can also use them as types. So the true type and the false type now have the kind of bool. The single quote here just indicates that the constructor is being promoted to a type and it's best practices to, to do that. Um, next, I'm gonna do a quick demonstration um, going a little bit more into what you can do with type level programming. So what we're going to do is define a restaurant data type and we're going to store its status as a type variable. The status here can either be open or closed. One thing you can do with data kinds is actually encode requirements in the types of your functions. So closed restaurant, for example, will take in an open restaurant. It requires that the restaurant be open um, before it can close it. And so if I go ahead and run this, um, first what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna display the kind of restaurant. And you can see that restaurant has the kind status to star. It takes in a status before it can be an actual type. And if we apply it to a status, we can see that now has the kind of star. All right, and so if we go ahead and create a restaurant, if we look at its type, we can see that restaurant is now an open restaurant. And if you try to open a restaurant that's already open, we'll get a compile time error saying that open restaurant required its restaurant to be closed before you open it. But the restaurant we gave it was open. Now, types in Haskell will go away at compile time. And so what happens if you need to do different things at runtime based on the type? And one way you can do that is using type classes where you can implement a function differently based on the type. And so here we have status label where its string is going to be different based on the type. But notice how status label has just the type of string. So if you say print status label, how would Haskell know which status label to print? And in order to do that, uh, what Haskell does is you can use type applications here to specify that this status at the type level is the status type that we're going to get the status label of. And so if I go ahead and display the open restaurants message, we can see that it displays that the restaurant is open. But if we show the message after closing the restaurant, we can see that it's now closed. So we can get different things at runtime based on the type level. 
Okay. So uh, one, one final technique that I want to go over is type families. And type families are basically just functions that operate on types instead of values. So when you apply int, the type int to foo, uh, it resolves to a list of int. And similarly, foo bool will resolve to maybe bool. Um, I haven't gone over all the techniques of type level programming, but hopefully we should know enough by now to actually implement ASON schemas. So taking a step back, what does this library need to do? The first thing we need to do is define the schema at the type level. The second thing we need to do is be able to parse JSON data into an object with that schema. And lastly, we need to be able to extract data from the object. So first, we're going to define the schema at the type level. And in order, to do, in order to do that, we need to define a data type that will represent the schema. So uh, here we'll define a schema type data type, um, and it will have different constructors for all of the different types of schema that we'll support. Um, here, we're only going to implement a subset of schemas um, just for the sake of time. Um, so the schemas that we'll support is schema int, schema text. Um, we'll support a list of other schemas and an object that maps keys to the schema at that key in the object. A uh, symbol here is just a type level string. So uh, yeah. Um, and with just this single type definition, uh, we're able to write a schema at the type level. Um, we're using single quotes here. Um, no, note that we need to use single quotes um, to use type level lists and type level tuples um, in order to uh, to have type level lists and tuples um, and not just to have a normal Haskell list of ints or things like that. So now we've defined our schema at the type level and now we need to parse data into an object with that schema. So first what we'll do is define an object data type that will store the schema as a type parameter. And this object will store a hash map from a key to a dynamic value. And this dynamic value is going to be the JSON value that we parse to the actual Haskell type, like int or, or text. <clears throat> but then we're going to convert it to dynamic um, in order to store all these different types in the same hash map. And as long as we don't export the unsafe object constructor, um, dynamic should always correspond with the schema. So it should be, um, we, we, sh we, sh we shouldn't have any conversion issues there. Next, we need to implement the schema result type family. And this will just map the schema to the corresponding Haskell type. Um, should be pretty straightforward for most of them. And schema object is just going to store, uh, is going to resolve to an object with the schema object stored as its schema. Next, we're going to define an is schema type type class, um, which we'll implement for each uh, schema type. And this is going to be the type class that we use to parse a value for that schema. And lastly, from JSON is going to um, parse an object schema um, and, and use parse value in order to parse the object. Um, and one thing I'm not going to do here, but one thing that ASON schemas does do is it'll provide a nice error message if it fails parsing. So if we have a schema where foo.bar is going to be a list of text, um, but the JSON data has foo.bar being a number, if we run this program and try to parse it, um, we'll get an error at runtime saying that you can't parse the foo.bar path with this schema with the JSON value that we got the number one. Um, so that's just uh, uh, an additional thing that the library does, um, but we're not going to do that here. Um, so for, nor for, for standard data types like int and text, we can go ahead and just use the normal parse JSON function. Um, but for schema list, what we're going to do is we're going to extract the list of values from the JSON array. And then for every JSON value, we're going to parse the value according to the inner schema. And then lastly, we need to um, parse a schema object, right? And so what we're going to do is iterate through the schema and parse each schema uh, for, for the key. Um, so first, what we need to do is convert the type level key to a string. And symbol val is a function that will let us do that. Then we need to parse the rest of the schema. Uh, oh, sorry. We need to look up th uh, this key, the current key in the JSON object, and then parse it according to the inner schema. Uh, 
And then we need to parse the rest of the schema using the same object. And then we need to insert this key into the rest of the object um, after converting the parsed value to dynamic. And then lastly, we need the base case where if we finish traversing through the schema, we're just going to return an empty object. And so at this point, we're able to parse data into an object. Um, and now we need to extract data um, from the object into back into normal Haskell types. So what we're going to do is implement a get key function, which is going to take in the key as a type application and the object and return the Haskell type corresponding to that key. And the first thing we're going to need to do is implement a lookup schema type family. And this type family is going to take in a key and a, an object and return the schema at that key in the object. And this is pretty straightforward thanks to the first class families package, which provides these functions, which um, are pretty similar to the normal Haskell functions. So first we're going to look up the key in the schema and then use from maybe to get the schema at that key. And what we're, what we're able to do is if the key doesn't exist in that schema, we're able to define a custom type message using type error. Um, and this will display the, the error message that we saw at compile time uh, that displayed if a key didn't exist in the schema. And so to implement get key, um, it's going to take in an object with the schema and it's going to look up that key in the schema using the lookup schema type family. And then it'll get, it'll use schema result to get the corresponding Haskell type for that schema. And with this type definition, the compiler can now infer the resulting type given only the initial schema and the key. And then to implement it, we just get the key from the object um, and then convert that dynamic to the Haskell type we inferred with schema result. And again, this should never fail because uh, we've already parsed the Haskell type um, and converted it to dynamic for the schema. And now we're able to do the full, the full workflow um, where we define a schema at the type level. We can decode that schema and then we can extract uh, keys from that object using get key. Uh, and this is all going to be type safe also. Um, I'm not going to go over how the closet quarters are implemented, but basically all you need to do is generate template Haskell code um, that will um, generate code that looks like this, and it should all still work. Um, so with that, I just have some final thoughts of this presentation. Um, so first, a uh, uh, huge thanks to Haskell Love for giving me the opportunity to present today. Uh, this was my first conference talk, and it was, it was truly an amazing experience for me, um, this whole process. I also want to thank my company, Leap Year, for my time there. Um, I've grown so much as a developer at this company, um, but I've also grown so much as a person. And I definitely wouldn't be up here if not for my amazing coworkers. If you'll, if you'll allow me a quick plug, um, we're based in San Francisco and we work on privacy preserving analytics. We primarily work in Haskell, Scala, and TypeScript, but we promote functional programming best practices throughout our code base. We're also hiring. So if that sounds like a good time to you, check out our website and take a look at our job openings. And with that, um, I will be jumping on to the Q&A Zoom call. Um, and if you have any questions or if you just want to chat, feel free to, to jump on there and I look forward to chatting with you. Um, if not, feel free to reach out to me afterwards over Slack or on Spatial Chat. And um, yeah, I, I really look forward to interacting with you all. Thank you for tuning in and I hope you stay healthy.